Washington. And as you guys know from my email, I responded that this lecture really isn't involved in the textbook. And in fact, you really can't find it in any one textbook. Because in reality, it's been produced from a lot of years of research from a number of textbooks and also a number of publications, you know, in, in terms of research. So what you're getting is a conglomeration of a lot of unique material. Okay? So what we're going to do today is we're going to start off kind of with a question. Last lecture we discussed skeletal muscle tissue, and in particular, how it contracts, how it's exerting torques and forces. Yes? Okay. Now, someone goes in the weight room, let's say, and they're lifting weights and they get stronger. Generally speaking, what do we see occurs in the muscle tissue? It grows, right? And our scientific term for that is? Hypertrophy. Hypertrophy. Well, you know, several decades ago, they began looking at strength adaptations, okay? And they looked and saw, in a number of cases, that individuals were getting stronger without actually getting an increase in muscle tissue size. Not that it, it obviously occurs, it obviously contributes to strength, but there are many cases where individuals are getting stronger and not increasing the muscle size. In fact, for those of you who have lifted, it actually has occurred on a number of occasions. Okay? My question to you is, how is that occurring? What, what's allowing for that? Okay. Neurological adaptations. Okay? That's what we're going to talk about today. Okay? Now, before we can delve into that, as you guys know, I have a large background in motor control and neurological adaptations. So you're kind of a unique look today on these adaptations. Okay? But I need to provide you with about five minutes of background on some neural information, and then it's all applied. Okay? The first thing you need to understand about controlling human movement is that all, and by the way, you know me, I post my lecture notes online, so I just posted them online for you guys. But this is what you need to be sensitive to. All voluntary movement begins in the motor cortex with intent. Okay? And you'll find that in your notes online, too. All voluntary movement begins in the motor cortex with intent. You have an intent to want to do something. You have an intent to want to run. You have an intent to want to bench press, right? Um, <laughs> what we have here, the motor cortex is a region that's lateral. Okay, in, in the brain, the wrinkly uh, region of the brain, the outer, the, the cortex here. Laterally, we have the motor cortex. Okay, and arising out of the motor cortex is a upper motor neuron. Okay, remember, it's an upper motor neuron, a neuron that has to do with neural, you know, control of, of, of human movement. So, an upper motor neuron arises out of the motor cortex. That then goes to where? Yeah, muscle. The spinal cord. Okay. <laughs> here's, here's a, like my spinal cord. The spinal cord. The spinal cord. And then it goes to a muscle. Okay? The point being that it synapses, which means it connects, with a neuron in the spinal cord. And then that neuron in the spinal cord connects to the muscle. So we have an upper motor neuron. That, that motor neuron in the spinal cord must be a... A lower motor neuron. Okay? That motor neuron is innervating or controlling as many as a few, say three, muscle fibers to as many as over 100. Okay? But a lower motor neuron, okay, a lower motor neuron in all of the muscle fibers that it innervates is known as a what? Motor unit. A motor unit. So you want to know that. A lower motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it innervates is a motor unit. That's your basic, that's your fundamentals, guys. That's what it's all about. Now, you notice that I said that it can innervate as many as three, as, as few as a three, to as many as over a hundred. Why? Why? 
why would you have smaller motor units and then larger motor units? You have like movements and like Yes. We can generally, you know, distinguish movements into fine movements, like when I'm drawing on the board, to gross movements like a vertical jump. Right? Okay. Fine control, it's easier to control a relatively few amount of muscle fibers. Okay? The gross movements, you're just talking about high force movements. The control is going to be a lot lower in those movements. We can exert a lot of torques and a lot of forces. Okay? Alright. The next concept before we move on to neurological adaptations, we're going to talk about a real interesting subject. Patrick, now I know you said that you kind of got into this field because you were real athletic, did a lot of sports, right? Alright, all right, I need your help. Come on, I need your help. <laughs> yeah, it's not a <laughs> Now, Patrick, do you ever play baseball? Uh, a little bit? Alright. Artis right, Retain is a great baseball player. Okay? And what I'm having you do, Patrick, is throw a slow pitch. Just throw a pitch for the class. Like you got a ball, wind up. Like a real pitch? Like a pitch. Wind up and throw it. Good job, good job, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I like it. I like it. Okay? Now, imagine that he's just, he's the man. And we're ESPN. And he's getting rid of his kids, right? And the cameras are going off. The flash bulbs are going off. And so go ahead, like, pitch real slow. Real slow. And he's on ESPN. All right. Now, pause. All right. Now, when you see him in slow motion, we're able to capture every movement. What does it look like on ESPN when he's moving? It's ugly, isn't it? I mean, this thing looks like a whip. His arm's contorted. It's twisted. It's all over the place. And we're wondering, I'm wondering, I know this, how the heck is his limb not being ripped off his body? It's so, just, it's so contorted, right? So, but if you were to look closer... You see several adjustments are being made that are keeping his limb in his body. Very minute adjustments are keeping this thing from being ripped off his body. Literally, control of his arm. But they're occurring too fast for him to consciously be controlling his arm. So what's controlling it? If you can't consciously control these little movements, <laughs> reflexes, good job, Patrick. So Does he call that? Knee jerk. Knee jerk, right? So we call that the stretch reflex. Okay? Now, the stretch reflex, you know, here's your spinal cord. Let's say here, you have a muscle out here. And essentially, inside of a muscle, you have special sensory fibers that are sensitive to. Stretch. stretch. So you have special sensory fibers embedded in the fiber that are sensitive to stretch. Yeah, it definitely can. These are specialized sensory fibers that are sensitive to stretch. And when an individual stretches with a great magnitude, it's sensitive to the magnitude of stretch. So if he's pitching, he has a large magnitude, yes? And to the rate of stretch. So, how fast he's moving, and how long that that stretching contraction is. So, the, the, the longer he stretches, the further he stretches, the more rapid he stretches, the more these sensory fibers are activated. When they're activated, they send a signal back to the spinal cord, and the spinal cord sends a signal back to the muscle fiber to do what? To contract. And that's the adjustment. The point is... The muscle stretch sends the information back to the spinal cord. Immediately, the spinal cord sends information back to the muscle to contract. That's stretch reflex. It's just, it's it's very rapid. It occurs about 30 to 40 milliseconds. Okay? So, now, the stretch reflex is more than control things. It also enhances force that way. So, for example, a pitcher, why do they wind up? What are they trying to do? They're trying to, yes, they're trying to create more force for me. Because 
they're actually activating the stretch reflex. Yeah, they're storing energy here, but they're also activating the stretch reflex. Okay? A runner, if they're sprinting, every time they land, they're stretching out, you know, the Achilles, the, the, the tendon, the Achilles tendon, that's stretching the gastrocnemius, you know, all the calf muscles, and you get a reflex contraction. Okay? So, what happens, we know is this. It's sensitive to the rate of, of, of stretch. So the more rapid that turnover is when they're running, the more involved the stretch reflex is. That's why runners are trying to increase their turnover rate when they're running. They're actually activating that stretch reflex more and more and more. Does anyone know what technique people do to kind of train the stretch reflex? Box jumps. Box jumps, and that is what? Plyometrics. Plyometrics. Plyometrics is kind of ballistic movements, like box jumps, you kind of step off a box and jump up. You get a rapid stretch and you jump up. Okay? So plyometrics seem to enhance the stretch reflex, and so people will train with that. That's kind of a background on your reflexes, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Do you guys have any questions on that? <coughs> Okay, it's plyometric strain stretch, stretch reflex because, okay, you activate stretch reflex based on rapid stretching to the magnitude of stretch. So if someone is jumping off a box and jumping up immediately, when they land, they're stretching out their calves, their quadriceps, their hamstrings really rapidly. They're trying to jump up as fast as they can immediately. So that way there's a rapid stretch and a rapid transition. Okay, so they're trying to work on that transition. That's kind of what it would are doing. Okay? Now we're going to move into neurological adaptations. You needed some background on that. On, on that stuff. And the first thing I want you to be sensitive to is the size principle. The size principle. The size principle has to do with motor unit recruitment. We know we have a number of motor units. Just like your, your, your what, what types of muscle fibers do we have? Slow twitch and fast twitch, right? And the fast twitch can be separated into the type 2 fast twitch and the, and the type 2A and the type 2B fast twitch, right? Or intermediate fast twitch, they're more resistant to fatigue, and then the highly fatigable fast twitch. So... The largest ones being the highly fatigable or fast twitch 2B muscle fibers. Okay. It's the same thing with motor units. You have slow twitch motor units, your intermediate type 2A motor units, and your highly fatigable <coughs> type 2B motor units. Okay? Same deal. And each motor unit has more and more muscle fibers. So the slow twitch motor units have a very low amount of muscle fibers. And then your fast twitch intermediates have their larger muscle fibers, more number, and then your largest big brutes, the highly fatigable 2B motor units have the largest muscle fibers. Okay? So if you know your muscle fibers, you know your motor units. Yes. Yes. Just like you have type 1 or slow twitch and type 2A, and type 2B fast twitch muscle fibers, you have type 1 motor units, type 2A motor units, and type 2B. That means the motor neuron in type 1 is controlling slow twitch muscle fibers, right? In type 2A, you're controlling <coughs> type 2A muscle fibers. See, does that make sense? Okay. The size principle says this. We have a gradient of force production. In other words, you know, I can pick up this marker, and I'm only using a few motor units. Okay, if I turn on all my motor units, you know, every time I comb my hair, all hell would break. But the point is, I can have fine, fine movement, right? With lower forces, we recruit lower, smaller motor units. As force increases, 
we start to recruit larger motor units. Okay? So you recruit motor units based on the force of action or the speed of movement. Okay? So if we look, <coughs> what's important to this is, especially on specificity, let's take, this is both an endurance and resistance training. Let's take your endurance athlete. And he's working a bunch. He needs to have time to, you know, do a lot of running or whatever. It's raining a lot. It's a rainy season. And he's training a lot just on a flat treadmill. Then he goes up in a race, okay? And he's riding on flat ground. All of a sudden, there's, the race has a lot of hills. Once he starts moving up the hills, what happens to his motor unit recruit? It increases. It increases. You need to know that you do not get an adaptation in motor units you do not train, okay? So if he's all of a sudden moving up this hill, and he's activating motor units that he wasn't activating on a flat treadmill because there wasn't enough there wasn't enough resistance. He's now just incorporated motor units and muscle fibers he never tracked. See what I'm saying? And now he's messed up. Okay, he's not. Now he's going to hit fatigue because those are not training muscle fibers. So obviously, if what you do when we talk about specificity, there's a number of variables we can look at at specificity. But one is the geometry of the movement you're trying to get good at. If someone's going on a race. They need to study the terrain they're going on. Because motor unit recruitment is going to be specific to that terrain. If there's a lot of hills, they need to train on a lot of hills. So that those muscle fibers that are involved in those motor units are highly trained. See what I'm saying? Obviously, the best way to do that is to do what? Run the course. If the course is somewhere different, you still need to be familiar with its geometry so you can mimic it, find a hilly area. If you're on the treadmill, you should be mimicking that kind of race. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? That's kind of understanding the geometry of what's going on. Specificity. We can also look at specificity in terms of weight training. Okay? Because um, if you look, for example, at a shot putter. Okay? Now, does anyone know the optimal angle for a shot putter? 45 degrees. About 45 degrees. Now, he goes in the weight room to increase his shot put. And he's getting good at flat bench. You think that's going to have transfer, it's going to activate motor units that are relative to his shot put. Yes or no? You're going to see very little transfer because he's, he's benching flat. What should he do? He should do hand clock. You understand what I'm saying? Whatever movement you guys are going to do, and you want to recruit specific motor units for that movement, you need to analyze the geometry of that movement and mimic that in the weight room if you're doing a weight room exercise. So if he's doing a 45-degree shot put, he should be doing a 45-degree incline bench. See what I'm saying? That's understanding the pattern of movement. Okay? All right, questions. That is our size principle. Okay. The next thing we move on to is we got to look at, at these motor units. And these motor units are over here. Okay. This is force production. All right. These circles are motor units. And like I said, I have this drawn for you guys online. <coughs> These circles are motor units. Every motor unit has what we call a threshold. Okay. Meaning the lower intense, the lower, smaller motor units have a lower threshold to actually activate them. So to activate them, it requires less stimulus from the nervous system to activate smaller motor units. Larger motor units require a higher, they have a higher threshold and it takes more to activate them. This is an untrained individual. This untrained individual is doing, a, say, a one repetition maximum performance. It's the most weight they can lift. This is how many motor units they can recruit. Okay? What do you notice here? Yeah. 
they can't recoup these diamonds, these motor units. This is their threshold. This, this is when I when I draw an X over this, that's the motor units they're able to recruit. They can't recruit these. They don't have the ability. They haven't learned, learned yet the ability to recruit those those actual motor units. Does that make sense? So, do they have? Can they produce more force? I mean, is it intrinsically capable? Would they be intrinsically capable to produce more force if they recruit those motor units? Yeah. So what do you think one of the adaptations of training is? The ability to recruit more motor units. So a training adaptation would be they actually would increase their ability to recruit those motor units. Do you understand that if you're able to do that, you would get stronger without increasing muscle mass, right? So most people can't recruit all their motor units. It's a training adaptation. And the adaptation is specific to very high force output movement. The higher the force, or the faster the movement, the more motor units you can recruit. You understand what I'm saying? So, that's a specific adaptation. So, if you're training long endurance, are you going to learn to recruit those higher motor units? And it may actually, you know, inhibit some of that. But the point being that that's an adaptation. That's one of the first ones that you want to know. You learn to recruit more motor units. The next adaptation is asynchronous versus synchronous firing, okay? And like I said, guys, just take like notes because this is all in your notes, I'm on. So you need to over, right. But what I'm saying is you have asynchronous versus synchronous firing, okay? You have no, a number of motor units in your muscle tissue. And one of the earliest studies done on neurological adaptations was on asynchronous and synchronous firing. Basically, if you have all these motor units, you can activate, if you're running, you can activate one population of motor units, and it can allow you to move. When they get tired out, you activate another population of motor units. So they're asynchronously firing, not in synchrony. You activate one population, they fatigue out, you activate another one. They fatigue out, you might go back to the first one. Does that make sense? So it's good because it allows some motor units to rest, and some to be activated. So if you're doing long, like let's say Jason or Trey, they're getting ready to go on a race, right? Yeah. Jason's still okay. <laughs> Is he getting ready to go on a race? Yep, tomorrow. So they're doing endurance training. So they want to be able to rest some motor units and train some. So they're going to have asynchronous firing, right? But for max force production, what do you want? Synchronous firing. You want those motor units firing all at once. Now, my mentor, who I work with extensively in my master's program and my undergrad, was Dr. Milner, Milner Brown. Now, Milner Brown, way back in the, in the <clears throat> 70s, was the first to investigate this. And he's one of the first to even investigate neurological adaptations. So I got to learn a lot from him. But he was one person to find that one of the adaptations was moving from asynchronous firing to synchronous firing. Again, it'd be how you get stronger. And you look at specificity again, and you're peaking for an event that has that requires high force or speed. Should you be doing a lot of high endurance activities at that time, peaking for the event? No, because it trains you to asynchronously fire. You want to train to synchronously fire. That's why when people peak for an event, they cut out things that are inhibiting the peak. Same thing for someone who's trained long endurance. Before the event, they want to peak for the event and, do, and train for asynchronous firing. Okay? So, synchronous would be the high force, etc., etc. Now, before we take a break, the last one I want to talk about is... Does that make sense, everyone? <coughs> Alright. The, the next one I want to talk about is the rate of firing. The rate of firing. This one's kind of interesting. Firing rate, one neuron, one neuron, can, can every time it stimulates a muscle fiber to contract, that's a fire. It fires. We say it fires. Every time that happens, it fires. Now, in the lab, what scientists did was they took muscle fibers out, and they stimulated the fiber and measured its force output. Okay? So you take, take a muscle fiber out. This is force. 
Okay? And we're going to stimulate the muscle fiber to contract. This is a twitch. Contraction, heat force, relaxation. We call that a twitch. Well, scientists notice that when you, if you, before the muscle fiber relaxes, if you stimulate it again, it does that. The force goes up. Okay? Yeah. They would then stimulate it again so that you couldn't even distinguish between contractions. They almost fused. So the more you stimulate it, the higher the force went. To a plateau. We call that tetanus. So you keep stimulating this muscle fiber and force keeps going up. Why? And why do you think that is? Well, let me ask you something. And by the way, that's, remember, firing rate of a, so the faster a motor neuron is firing, what's going to happen to force? It's going to go up. If you can fire a motor neuron faster, your force is going to go up. Right? Just like in mimicking the lives. Does that make sense? Okay. Which is one of the adaptations that occurs with training. You get an increase in firing. My question is why? What is the key to muscular contraction? The action potential, what is the action potential stimuli to be released in the side of Calcium. And Raphael last time said, well, can you manipulate calcium to increase force? The nervous system does. If you fire, you release calcium. Now, when you relax, that calcium gets pumped back into where? The sarcolemic, I mean the sarcoplasmic, that's our sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? If you fire before that calcium has gone back in, what gets more, we get it's released more. Calcium. So you keep releasing more and more calcium in the cell, you get more and more binding between what? Actin and myosin. So you get more and more cross bridges. That's the concept. That's firing rate increasing. See what I'm saying? Okay? So that's the thing. So you get an increase rate of fire. The other intriguing thing that goes on with rate is that another tra training adaptation is for power is that you can reach your max rate faster. So, um, if we're looking at this is rate. Let's say that this is both of their max rate of firing. Okay. Notice that this person here was able to reach the max rate faster. Right? Another adaptation is you can reach that maximum rate faster, which is important for power. You understand power is what? Work, work time over time. time. Which is work is force times distance. So the faster you can get force up, the more powerful you're going to be throughout a movement. So in terms of rate, you increase the rate of firing. And another one is you increase the time, you shorten the time to get to that rate. Okay? You would train for that. For That's a high power type of activity. So we're not talking about slow, slow contractions even with heavy weights. We're talking about, you know, 40 to 60% of your 1RM and explosive, right? Jumps. Very explosive movements are going to train you to reach your rate of firing faster. It's all about specificity. Any questions before the break? Now, this next topic we're going to talk about is um, it's definitely interesting. Everyone's heard of the story. Everyone's heard of the story where mom's out with her kid and the kid gets trapped under a car. Everyone's heard of this. Yeah. And the mom, it's in the papers everywhere, and the mom, she does what? She lifts the car. Now think about this. When we're talking about lifting a car, we're talking about, if you were looking at the deadlift record, she's probably breaking the world record for deadlift at that stage. <laughs> now think about this for a second. What is it that's allowing <laughs> this individual <laughs> adrenaline? We're talking about high arousal. High arousal. This individual to pull this car. Think about it. I mean, she's 
It's dramatic. She reaches down and she lifts, dead lifts this car up. What's the line for that? I'll tell you what's the line for that. She's in the hospital the next day. Okay? <laughs> because all of her muscle fibers are ripped off her body. Okay? She's got pulled muscles. She's got strains. And she's not in good shape. Okay? She's not in good shape. But she did, but she, but she saved her baby. Okay? She saved her baby. Here's the point, guys. You have the capacity within you to produce such high forces of contraction that you could actually do that. You could tear muscle groups. Okay? But your body has inhibitory mechanisms which stop that. So that we can't exert all our forces. All our torque. Under conditions of high arousal, a lot of those inhibitory mechanisms are disinhibited, essentially. Okay? And what, what essentially what happens is inside of your, for example, inside of the tendons, and I discussed this in the notes, in the tendon itself, you have a number of sensory organs. And when there's high forces on that tendon, high forces that are near injury, it sends signal back to the nervous system, and the opposite of the stretch reflex happens. It sends a signal back to the muscle to stop contracting. See what I'm saying? In other words, if we're in danger, our nervous system's shutting things down. It protects us. Okay? But one of the things trained athletes do is they learn to disinhibit some of that inhibition. See what I'm saying? Now, fortunately, they've trained a lot. So their tendons should be strong enough to kind of bear that load. But, obviously an individual who's under high arousal, is not trained, is going to have a high risk for injury, right? Now, we, you need to train that beginning, that's why you get psyched up. Why do you think you pump yourself up before a set? You might disinhibit some of that inhibition. But it also is a training adaptation system. Disinhibit those inhibitory methods. So, that's, that's an interesting adaptation. The other thing is we look and we see, you know the neuromuscular junction. You guys are familiar with the neuromuscular junction. The junction between the, uh, the motor neuron, the axon terminal, and the motor end plate. What's interesting is that motor end plate would train will increase in size. Actually, I heard you. What is also interesting is, are these in contact? No. They're not anatomically connected. They're physiologically connected, yes? Okay? Meaning that neurotransmitters are, it's, it's a physiological connection, not anatomical. What do you think happens to the space? It gets smaller. So the diffusion di difference is different. Okay. Well, you have ACH receptors on the motor end plate, right? What do you think happens to their concentration? It goes up. You see how the body can do all these different things? Okay, it's really interesting. So that's kind of the neuromuscular junction. This next one is, is definitely um, a good one to study. Let's say we take a leg press. And an individual can leg press, say, 100 pounds with their left leg and 100 pounds with their right leg. Put them together, 100 pounds left, 100 pounds right, put them together, how much do they be able to leg press? 200. Well, wait, wait, wait. Well, we take them in the lab, and they're only leg pressing 160. What's going on? Now, this is bilateral movement. When you're doing one leg, that's unilateral movement. Yes? This is bilateral. We call this, we call the difference between how much they can lift bilaterally and how much they can lift unilaterally, the bilateral deficit. It's a deficit. And it's interesting really, what's going on. Bilaterally, they're not able to lift as much as they can unilaterally. Now, what's going on is, how am I walking? 
I'm not hopping along. I'm walking unilaterally. My movements are unilateral. You understand what I'm saying? So, if we're putting them together, it's not what the body's normally used to. It's neurological. It's not used to coordinating that, that thing, right? So you're not used to that bilateral coordination. So you can't produce as much force. What do you think one of the adaptations is to training? What do you think happens to that bilateral deficit? It decreases. You actually then can lift as much as you can unilaterally. So you get that adaptation. Okay? What you really want to be sensitive to in specificity is this, guys. If you got someone who's practicing the vertical jump, do you want them doing unilateral movements? No. Okay? So if they're doing lunges, walking lunges, that's counterintuitive. They're trained, they're not, they're training unilaterally. Okay? You want them doing what? Squat. Squat, is that? Jump squats, you know, squats. It's gotta be for them it's gotta be unilateral. But let's say we take a hockey player, so I play hockey. Now I'm skating one stride at a time. Could lunges apply to me? Okay. See, that's specificity. You need to understand that. What's actually kind of intriguing, though, about that this, you know, for exam or whatever, you see, you know, bilateral deficit. But we also find bilateral facilitation. What does that mean? It means bilaterally you can lift more, you can't unilateral. That's, it's, it's kind of interesting. What's highly trained athletes? If they're training really bilaterally a lot, they actually train more bilateral than unilateral. It's, it's, it's an interesting adaptation. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. That's bilateral deficit. Now, the next one is the last kind of interesting adaptation we'll talk about today before we talk about one real, this, I'm just going to diagram what you see. But it's cross transfer effects. It's the cross transfer effect. This has been known in motor learning for over the last century. And here's cross transfer. You take an untrained individual or someone's not used to an exercise. And you have this individual, they're doing they're doing one arm dumbbell curls with their left arm. Their left arm increases, let's say over an eight weeks time, I don't know. Let's say twenty pounds. In their left arm. It grows too. Their right arm doesn't grow, but they have a 10 pound increase in strength. So training the left arm actually got an increase in the right arm. We call that the cross transfer effect. What the heck? You train my left arm, you get an increase in my right arm. What's going on? What the heck? What's going on? Right? <laughs> so, anyway, here's what we think is going on. We think that this is a central issue. Obviously, this arm grew. That's producing some of the force action. Centrally, though, what's controlling the limb is different. Okay, I'm not going to go too in-depth into this, but what we think is happening is this. And this was what my, my, well, my, my dissertation was on the motor program. I did three experiments on the motor program. Okay? For my uh, master's thesis. We think that movements, like throwing a baseball, shooting a basketball, swinging a bat, are controlled by programs, motor programs that contain the instructions to swing that bat, to, to shoot the basketball. When you load up, say, Excel on the computer, it's a program. You load up Microsoft Works, it's a program. You swing a bat, you load up a motor program. So the instruction, why do you think people are able to do things automatically? Why do you think they're not thinking about it? Because they upload that program, and that same thing is being run off automatically. It's allowing them to think about other stuff. The program is separate from the limb. So it can be run off in the left arm and the right arm. Almost like you can run music on the left speaker and the right speaker. And there's a lot of evidence for that. So it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. That's cross-transfer with this. So, now I'm going to just draw timelines the last thing. It's drawn up a timeline for you guys so you can see what occurred. We know we have both neurological adaptations and we 
know we have muscular adaptation. Now, early on in training, if this is force, this is strength, this is time, say this is 16 weeks. Out of here, 16 weeks. If you look early on in training, you, a lot of the gains are neurological. But then that kind of starts to go down. And what starts to account more for results is this is muscle hypertrophy. So this is growth of the muscle. That starts to account more for the results as you move over time. This is a 16-week program. This is what we think is happening. And this kind of goes like this. Over 16 weeks' time, you know, the person starts to plateau. Um, of course, we don't completely know what happens when you introduce AX, which is... Anabolic steroids, right? I mean, that's another question. What happens to this curve when you introduce that? But the point is, without that, if you look here, neurological adaptations start to lower, hypertrophy starts to increase more. We don't know what's happening way further out here. Because most of the studies are 16 weeks. We think that neurological adaptations are actually coming into play more at the later stage of training, like if these people who have trained for you know, over a decade. That it's actually starting to be incorporated more and more and more. But that's another story. Um, another time, another talk. But the point being that for the 16 weeks, generally you get first it's neurological, then it's that person. Uh, that's the first question. This is a standard thing we always put on these graphs. Animal and steroids. Yeah, the one that has one. This is what we don't know. This is still neural. We think that far out.